All right, Wizards of the Coast, you uh, failed that intimidation roll. Do you want to try and roll persuasion? You're going to be doing it at disadvantage. Why is the Dungeons and Dragons community so angry? Some of you already know what's going on. Some of you may have just caught the whiff of what's going on and are maybe curious. Some of you might haven't the slightest clue what it is I'm even referring to. Don't worry, I'll go over the basics. And I do want to emphasize what I'm going to go over is just the basics because I kind of want to talk about how this is revealing of larger corporate mentalities and that it's not the first time it's happened. And while disappointing, it's not surprising like at all. So we are going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons uh, and Wizards of the Coast, which is the company that controls it, which itself is a subsidiary of Hasbro. So um, <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons used to be its own thing. Wizards of the Coast bought it a while back and now Hasbro has bought them. So yeah, as I said, this is not going to be super detailed in terms of the granular level of exactly every specific detail that has changed. I'm going to be talking in broad strokes about the overall impact. And if I get something wrong, keep in mind that I feel like I have a pretty good handle on why the community is upset, even if some of the specific wording and terminology I might not have 100% down. If you want a complete breakdown of exactly what has been changed, there are people like with legal backgrounds who have gone over this thing with a fine tooth, fine tooth comb and can give you every single detail of what is being changed and the possible implications of that. I'm not going that granular on this. I just, I frankly, I don't have the spoons. And as I said, other people have done that already. Now, instead, I want to talk about the mentality behind it because I kind of feel like the nuts and bolts uh, and the people who are the most directly impacted and just outraged are kind of getting the most oxygen right now. And I just kind of want to talk about how, yeah, this is, uh, this is corporations. I don't know what you were expecting. But what was it that even happened? Okay, so Dungeons & Dragons, which you've probably heard of, especially if you're on... Uh, a geeky channel, but it is a tabletop role-playing game, kind of the definitive one. Not the first, and not even necessarily the best, but certainly the most prolific, most well-known, and probably the most popular by any kind of sales metric. It is a game that, that allows uh, one person, generally referred to as the Dungeon Master, to craft a story in which other players uh, get to create uh, their own individual characters, work their way through the story. It can be done as a completely uh, already created story that you can buy sort of these uh, modules for. You can make up your own just using the base set of rules that D&D has in place for things like magic and different races and what these things can do. You can mix in your own degree of homebrew material in terms of coming up with your own races or classes or your own monsters. You can mix and match to whatever degree you want to just have a real good time creating a story with friends. That's ultimately what it is. Now, for about the last 20 years, it's been operating under what's known as the OGL, the Open Game License. And the way the Open Game License works is basically why you have stuff like Dimension 20 and Critical Role, which the specifics of the narrative are very much, especially as time has gone on, been their own thing, but it's built on top of a core basis of things like Dungeons and Dragons. So they take that framework, which, you know, you do buy. You buy the resource books, or if you choose to subscribe to D&D Beyond, which is a website with a lot of the resources on it, you can do that. In some way, you have gotten a hold of these rules and then built your own stuff on top of that. And some people have been able to create very lucrative franchises that they are allowed to monetize and are their own creative um, expression that they have ownership of. And that's because of the way the OGL works, or rather worked, which basically meant that Whatever you make using these rules, that's yours. That's the really boiled down version of the OGL. Well, the OGL is being changed. What happened, I guess it was a week, two weeks. I don't know. This 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 actually feels like it's been going on um, a lot longer than it has, but a revision to the OGL got leaked. Now, the new OGL, OGL 1.1, which is not yet in effect and is probably being re-revised 
um, because of the fallout. I'll get to the fallout. But the short version is, is that it is saying, if you create something using our works and it makes over a certain amount of money, we expect residuals on that. While you can create whatever you want, if it's created through our system, we take ownership of it. And it basically is locking down the freedom of the OGL. And Dungeons and Dragons players are pissed about this. And not unreasonably. Because, you know, understand, the use of the OGL was everything from just creating your own, like, little um, module that you could then make available to people. Like, hey, I created this thing for D&D. And, like, you didn't have to officially go through um, Wizards of the Coast and get and get it licensed on a contract. Like, you made a thing that is compatible with D&D using D&D user rules. Here. Here. Let's let... Here. If you want this, you can have it. Here's a nifty new uh, story with a creature that I had. You can just make that available. You didn't have to worry about licensing. Cease and desists. The OGL meant that that stuff didn't happen. And now it can. And again, the, the exact wording is not something I'm going to get into, but it is absolutely a reversal of the spirit of the OGL. And Wizards of the Coast has been, since it has landed, as I said, extremely badly with the D&D community. Wizards of the Coast has been trying to walk it back being like, oh, well, we, I guess we rolled on that one on that. Yeah, it's, what a contrived line that was. And right now, nobody's buying it. But they are saying that they are rolling stuff back. One of the major things that they are saying they are not going to include when they actually do move forward is one of the things that was in there was that it was going to be retroactive. Meaning, you remember how I said they would claim uh, ownership over anything that doesn't have a licensing agreement that was made with their system? The original version of the update was going to be retroactive, meaning anything created under um, Dungeons & Dragons 5e, which is the current system, was going to be something they would lay claim to if they so chose, even if it was created prior to the update on the OGL. Which is which was admittedly a very large part of the sense of betrayal because suddenly what faith can you have in anything you create that it can be yours even if a contract says oh it no it's totally yours but if that contract gets revised in a way that says it's not anymore even if you made it back when we said it was tough and again this is very revealing of corporate mentalities as i said that looks like the part they're probably going to roll back on but everything about this in general regardless of the specifics to D D. This is very um, well-established corporate mentalities, especially when it comes to interactive medium and gaming. Because while Dungeons & Dragons is in many ways different from, say, video games, which are going through a lot of nonsense right now in terms of monetization and being built around that and maximizing that and not really caring if anybody enjoys the damn game or not, Dungeons and Dragons hasn't really been the subject to that kind of monetization. The way Dungeons and Dragons makes money is just through various deals they cut with licensees because like there's an official Lord of the Rings um, mod for Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. There's all this ancillary stuff, dice sets, new rule books, settings, um, the subscriptions on D&D Beyond. There's all these kinds of ways. But what was noted by executives at Hasbro was that the audience was, quote, under-monetized. And that, yeah, that's corporate thinking. And it's not at all shocking that it happened after Wizards of the Coast was bought by Hasbro. Because Wizards of the Coast, while not a small company, was small enough that they seemed to understand how important the goodwill of their customer base was. Because whatever else went on, and there's certainly some D&D players who like get uppity about every little change, and people argue over what's the best rule set, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's all that kind of stuff, but it's a very engaged fan base. And that goodwill, that is priceless. Uh, unless you're Hasbro, which is a much bigger company. Basically, corporate mentality tends to scale up. You can get corporate mentality at any 
at any corporation at any scale. I actually had a recent conversation with a friend about a significantly smaller uh, company that I'm absolutely not going to name. Um, but, you know, they were telling me some stuff about what was going on when as they were interacting with this company. And at first I was like, boy, I wasn't really expecting that. But then I realized the only reason I wasn't expecting it is because they were smaller than I would have expected. But I'm like, the mentality's there. It's a question of scale. Because when it was just Wizards of the Coast, they seem to understand the old mentality of uh, you can fleece a sheep as many times as you want. You can only skin it once. But you go to a larger scale corporate mentality and they say, why haven't you skinned that sheep? So this is also very much in line with stuff that we have seen in the video game industry. So I didn't make that comparison idly. Because this is taking cue from a number of actually generally recognized as very big blunders from the video game industry. But the fact that they went over badly there before doesn't make it any more surprising or, or any less surprising, rather, that it happened here. Here's some examples of how this has gone on before. Because the general mentality of this is basically a corporation going, hey, you know that thing that our fans and our customers do that gets them really engaged with and it just shows a love of our product? monetize it. That's ours. Claim it. So other examples of that, back when Nintendo uh, did this whole program where if you tried to live stream or do Let's Plays of their games without signing up for a program by which they would get a cut of any revenue, they would do takedown strikes on you, what you were doing. So they tried to do that uh, for a while, eventually abandoned that. But yeah, for a while, they went, hey, you know those things where people just love our games so much and people want to see them play it? Yeah. Grind money out of that. Demand a cut. And then there was one of the many Activision Blizzard bu uh, bungles. But that particular one that I'm thinking of in this case was with an update to an older game, that being Warcraft 3. When there was Warcraft 3 reforged, it was uh, supposedly an update but one of the things that it absolutely did update was update its end user agreement so that anyone who created anything using the tools built into the game that allowed you to make custom levels or do your own kind of thing and then create it for people, if you did it using their tools, they now owned it. And the reason for that was very clear because the entire genre that is known as MOBAs uh, was basically created by a Warcraft 3 mod. They wish they could have claimed ownership of that, and they couldn't. So they thought, well, we won't let that happen again. Here's the thing, though. There's a difference between, well, this is the way it's always been, and feeling like something's been taken from you. And that mentality I'll also come back to in a minute. But, like, the general idea, if, if when Dungeons and Dra & Dragons, you know, Last time they did an update to the end user agreement, if it didn't have the OGL, we wouldn't now be demanding one. Most of us would just assume, I mean, that that's just not something we're ever going to have. But we've had it. We've had it for a while now. And taking it away, you can call it OGL 1.1, but taking the old one away, you yeah, know, you're removing something that people love about your game. You're removing it or paywalling it or gatekeeping it. And people will always feel the sting more about something that they had and you take away from them than about something that you just never gave them in the first place. That having been said, though, there is another good comparison to make to video games, and it kind of comes to what I mentioned before. Uh, even though this kind of tactic has gone down very badly with other examples, it's not surprising that Hasbro did it. Because this, again, is a pretty standard tactic. A company does a thing that would make them a lot more money, but the customers don't go for it. Well, wait a few years, somebody will try again. Maybe the same company, maybe, maybe not. But all the companies that do the same thing will recognize, boy, that would make us a lot more money. So they'll wait a few years and they'll try again. And then if that doesn't work, they'll wait a few years and they'll try again. And again, to use the video game comparison, so much stuff that is now microtransactions used to be standard. Alternate costumes, uh, different lines of dialogue for characters 
These things used to be built into the games, at most like unlocked through gameplay or maybe a, a cheat code if you want to go way back. Now you have to pay for them. But we've now been in a world where paying for them has been standard long enough that there are entire generations of gamers that for them, that's just how it's always been. You have to be my age to go, no, but we lost something. They took it from us. They kept hammering at the idea until it stuck. And Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast has tipped their hand that even if the revision to the OGL is not nearly as restricted. Heck, even if they scrap the revision 100% and just leave it as is, they've tipped their hand for what they want to do. And that's not surprising at all. Because while a uh, organization that has a better understanding of its actual customer base would value the loyalty and the enthusiasm of those customers, The further away you get from that, so especially in the case of a company acquired by a larger company, that larger company is just looking at the numbers. It's just looking at your customers. It's just looking at how you've monetized it. And they're going, you really could be squeezing more money out of them. You're leaving money on the table. Fix that. We could be squeezing them for more money. We could be less generous. We could be more demanding and more controlling, and it would get us more money. It'll be curious to see if the size of the Dungeons and Dragons players revolt is as big as it looks right now. Because there seems to be a pretty good head of steam behind people abandoning D&D, canceling their uh, their D&D Beyond subscriptions to the point that so many people rush to cancel their subscriptions that actually crash the account management page on the site. But overall, this has a lot of momentum. And I think the thing that D&D has failed to realize is people can go other places. The OGL is probably one of, if not the primary reason, why D&D is the dominant gaming system. But if that's not there anymore, why stay? There are plenty of other systems. There are other systems that if you talk to people who use a lot of systems and go, oh, this is better than D&D. There's plenty of arguments to be had about whether systems are better. And there's lots of other systems that plenty of people I know go, oh yeah, that's better than D&D. But they still use D&D because of the community. And a lot of that community is built around the OGL. So the thing that made you bigger, you're going to destroy by attempting to milk more money out of it. It is looking at something going, we could be making more money right now and saying, do it. And they don't really care about the long term. Wizards of the Coast did when they were in an independent company because they had to worry about, you know, staying a solvent business. Hasbro doesn't have to worry about that. Hasbro can go, well, look, just try it. Try and milk everything we can out of it. Worst case scenario, it tanks the company, we close it down and we get to have a big write-off and we still make the investors happy because we'll have be seen as cutting cost. From Hasbro's perspective, they don't care if an individual branch of the company has long-term viability. They care about what it's doing right now because they can always just shut it down. Wizards of the Coast, when it was an independent company, wasn't going to do that. Because they weren't in a position where they go, well, we could make more money. It might burn the entire fan base, but let's roll the dice. Because they would have been gambling the entire company on that. Hasbro's just gambling an asset. They're not gambling their future as a conglomerate. And this is what happens when corporations get this big. This is what's going on with Warner Brothers right now as Any reason to have HBO Max is being steadily stripped away because it saves on costs, even as it makes the proposition of having HBO Max less and less appealing because there's less and less stuff on it. They don't care. They don't care about anything but the numbers. And that is almost always what happens. Now, I hate the fact 
I hate the fact that I'm about to praise Disney, but Disney's one of the few, and I'm not okay with how big Disney is, and I don't like how many companies they've acquired, but when it comes to actually letting them continue to manage themselves in the way that they were before, Disney's probably one of the best because by and large, they buy a company that's doing well and say, keep doing what you're doing. You'll have more money to do more of it. And maybe there's you know a certain amount of demand to crank out more stuff than is necessary, looking at the MCU right now. But they're not going in and fundamentally saying, uproot your entire plan. They just want you to scale up. Whereas when AT&T bought Warner Brothers, they immediately started messing with a ton of stuff. And then when Warner Brothers merged with Discovery, they're just throwing a bunch of stuff away. And when Hasbro acquires Wizards of the Coast, they see a chance to make more money. They don't care if it runs the company into the ground. And let's not even get started on the list of video game studios that were acquired by Electronic Arts to be shut down a few years later after Electronic Arts mandated certain changes to what they were doing and ran the company into the ground. Corporations being this big is bad for everyone except those big corporations. And understand that when I say that, if you are a smaller company, you get bought by those big corporations, you are not suddenly included as part of the big corporation for whom this benefits. You are at a separate level. The executive class of the parent company are the ones who benefit, them and the shareholders. Nobody else. No company that is acquired is in a better position. Well, why do they let themselves get bought? For the money. Whoever the owners are are getting paid out huge amounts of money. Sometimes there's threat of a hostile takeover. Sometimes there's threats from the larger companies that, hey, if you don't let us buy you, we will find a way to choke off your entire business and kill you. Because that happens. The amount of power that corporations and conglomerates have, yeah, of course this happened. And again, they're walking it back. We'll see how far they walk it back. But it's also tipped their hand. Something like this will be tried again. They'll go, oh, okay, so we went a little too far. We tried to, you know, make this leap. What if we only take it to here? Will they let us get away with that? Because once we're here, and we get them used to this, then we could go here and here and here and here and here. And oh, look, we ended up at the place where we tried to jump to immediately. Took us longer, but we got there. Again, you can look at video games for a lot of stuff like that. You would see the egregious things done with stuff like loot boxes. That was an overstep. But you know what the thing is? Before loot boxes, there still used to be a bigger outcry over microtransactions in general about overpriced DLC, about stuff being sectioned off that used to be part of a standard game experience. But once loot boxes happened, that was so much worse, everybody got mad about that. And once loot boxes started being less readily apparent in as many games, well, people weren't complaining about the old thing that used to be a problem anymore. If you keep pushing the envelope, while you might piss some people off, there's also a chance that maybe now they'll be relieved when you go back to the earlier thing that really shouldn't have been okay. Wizards of the Coast went too far and too hard, but they've revealed where they want to be. They've revealed the level of power and the position that they want to be in compared to the users. And like, there's a whole other thing. It's questionable how legally defensible the new OGL even is because like there's this whole thing where you can copyright all of the elements of the game, like the specific words of things, specific designs, images, you know, in the case of Monopoly, like the board design, all that's copyrighted. You can't actually copyright the rules of a game. So in theory, if people still wanted to keep using D&D, they can still use the route, not using their source books. You're going to have to basically kind of rework the rules into your own wording so you're not violating the copyright, maybe change the names of some of the races or whatnot. But you can, through your own worded means, have the same effective rule set legally. But 
you know, that also kind of gets into the same issue as how um, fair use is supposed to work on YouTube, which is that, yeah, that might not hold up in court, but that just means that if they ever do implement this, as it was originally worded, Hasbro will just make sure it never goes to court. They'll cut licensing deals with the big names, with Critical Role, with Dimension 20, with whoever. And the smaller people will just will just have to either just kowtow to it or abandon it altogether because while they might be legally in the right, they won't have the means to fight it. To make the comparison with YouTube, the way fair use is supposed to work, to use elements of something in order for the purposes of, of criticism, critique, analysis, or parody, that gets abused a lot with copyright claims on this platform. And the thing is, most of the cases, at least from my experience, definitely most of the cases where I've had videos claimed, even though it was clearly fair use, I had to stop fighting it. Because eventually it got to a point where the only way for me to fight this is to actually take them to court. And I cannot afford to do that. And so I'm at the whims of corporate overlords who are technically extending their influence beyond the boundaries of what the law is supposed to allow. But you need to have the funds and the resources to actually get justice, and most of us don't. We'll see what happens. As I said, this was much more about um, an analysis of corporate greed and just putting this into the context of, yeah, yeah, of course this happened. This happens all the time and it's gonna keep happening. It's gonna keep getting worse. Companies are too big, but our government won't make them smaller. What are your thoughts on any of this? Whatever they are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon's how I pay the bills. Any amount you can support me with is of great assistance. Even if you can't, like, share, subscribe helps me out. But what I really want you to remember is that you are beautiful, you are valid, and you are loved. You are the council. I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned. Well, it's Patreon supporter shout out time, folks. So thank you to Robin Moore, Zubin Lutfula, Tarak, the thing that goes doink in the anime, Oliver B, Angus Bjarnason, Linda Walters, Emu Delki, Leo the Boyd, Toy Loli, Becky Spark, Fernabilax the Poodle, Zach, Tracy Scrabbit, General Contact Unit Problem Child, Angry Casper, Tim Price, Adam R.D.L. Taylor, Shayla Gourlay, and Brendan Lewis. Thanks so much for your help. You can get your name right out too. Check out the rewards in the Patreon. Is that what they should do? Should they check the Patreon?